Let's get started. DJ 2PL. So you got a show this weekend, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know when? You don't know where it is. No, not yet. You don't know when it is. It's on campus? It's on campus, yeah. Is it real? Yeah, I mean, as real as it could get. Okay, all right, cool. All right, so we'll post on that, and, and I was talking about that on, uh, we're announcing that on Piazza, announcing a class on, uh, on, um, on Wednesday. We have a lot, to, a lot to discuss, a lot to go over, so let's jump right into it. Uh, so for the, on the dock of you guys, obviously Project Zero was, was due last night. Uh, we haven't gone through yet and looked at the results for everyone. Uh, I think we had about 150-something people complete it. That's, that's good. Um, Project one is out, and that'll be due on, uh, sorry, homework one has been out for a while, but we bumped the deadline up to this uh, like 15th or four days from now. Uh, so that should be re reflected in Gradescope. And then project one is out, and that'll be due on October 1st. Any questions about homework one? And I know there's somebody about, there was somebody posted on Piazza about project one. The leaderboard assignment doesn't work yet. Uh, we're still working, we're fixing that, and we'll push that on GitHub uh, later. La uh, Later, uh, later this week. Then I'll announce on Wednesday what the leaderboard is, what the implications of it are, uh, and why it matters, OK? All right. Uh, the other thing that's going on for, for additional things, if you want to learn more, go beyond the stuff we're talking about in the course, uh, there's a couple of database talks that are, are coming up. Uh, so today, after class at 4.30, we're having the, the Quadrant guys out of Germany. They're, they're one of these vector databases that target LLMs or ChatGPT kind of uh, setups. They'll be talking about their, the internals of their system, and that'll be, again, 4.30 over Zoom. Tomorrow at 6 p.m., the Databricks people are giving a talk somewhere, uh, somewhere, somewhere in the Gates building. It's a recruiting talk, but I, so that means they're probably going to feed you, uh, and then you can talk to them about getting jobs there. Um, Databricks has hired pretty much almost all my best students in the last two or three years. Uh, they've all gone to Databricks, and I was there in, in July, and they're all doing great. Um, they have a lot of money, and they don't give us any. Uh, no problem. And then uh, Auditorium is actually my startup, uh, but my, my former PG student who's a co-founder with me, Dana Van Aken, she'll be giving a talk about uh, what, what we're doing to using machine learning to optimize database systems. Uh, Postgres MySQL next week. Yes? Where can I find information about the location of these things? Uh, so my talks, the Quadrant 1 and Auditorium 1, that's on Zoom. And then if you go on the slides, the link here will take you to whatever it is on the, on the calendar. I don't, it's somewhere in Gates okay. for, the, for the Databricks one. Okay. Other questions? Again, these are optional. These are like, if you want to go beyond the stuff we're talking about in the course. And what I like about these kind of talks is like, even if, if you don't understand anything right away, uh, we'll hit these, a lot of these topics throughout the semester. And then you realize, that, like, I'm not crazy. Well, I'm crazy, but like, not that crazy that like, I'm not making stuff up. These are you know, the, the things we're talking about in this semester, you know, you need to know or are applicable to building real systems. OK? All right. So last class, we talked about. Uh, you know, sort of, you know, the initial setup for what the framework we're going to have in our minds for describing how we're going to build a, a database management system. And we discussed how it was a disk-oriented disk architecture where the, all the components in the system are really going to be uh, based around this, this key premise that the primary storage location of the database, when, is, when it is at rest, will be on some, some non-volatile disk, right? An SSD, spinning disk hard drive, doesn't matter. And that... The components of the system are really about moving the data back and forth between disk and memory because it's a von Neumann architecture. You can't operate on it while it's at rest, right? So that's really what the, the, you know, the, the big picture of what we're trying to achieve. And of course, now since disk is slow, we need to do a bunch of tricks and a bunch of other techniques to, uh, to hide the, the, the stalls of going to disk uh, by maximizing the amount of sequential I.O. And we'll see in the beginning right away today, we'll talk about a different method, an alternative to what we talked about last class that tries to maximize sequential I.O. And then again, there'll be other things like filters and indexes, a way to, re to reduce the amount of data we have to actually look at when we run queries. Then we also talked about a page-oriented storage scheme, uh, the slotted page architecture, where it would allow us to store tuples of arbitrary length, variable length sizes, uh, across these heap files. And then we could expand the, the, the size of the tuple as needed, you know, according to, according to whether it fit in the page or not, right? So I would say what we were describing last time is what I'll loosely term to as, as a tuple-oriented storage scheme. And what that really means is that the, the, the system is really about, I got a tuple, I got to put it somewhere, 
right? And, he, and, the, and the, the pages of the layout, the lay, layouts of the pages are really based around this, like, I got a tuple, like, let me store it. And so in this, in this architecture, if you wanted to insert a new tuple, the way you would do it is you go look in the page directory and find somewhere in, in, in your heap files a page with a free slot. Right? We said that the page directory would maintain metadata about what's, what space is available. And then we, once we have our page that we want to insert the tuple into, if it's, if it's, not, in mem sorry, if it's not in memory, they've got to go to disk, disk and fetch it in, which we'll talk about next week how we do that. But you know, think of like reading a file, bringing it to memory. And then with, once we have that page, we go look in that slot array, and we say, you know, what's the next free slot where we, we can store this tuple? Update the slot array, put the tuple inside the, the, the page, and then we're done. To update a tuple in this environment is basically the same thing. Uh, where we're, we're going to have some way to get the record ID of a tuple. All right, we said this is typically the page ID and the offset or the slot number. Right? Ignoring how we got that, which, which, is, which is what the index will do for us, Ignore, ignoring that, assume we could do that. We go, go in the page directory again, find the location of this page. If it's in, if it's in memory, we're, we're good. If not, we've got to go disk and get it. Then look at the page in the slot array, find the offset. And then if the new tuple we're trying to, or the updated tuple we're trying to, to, to install, if that's the same size of the original tuple, the existing tuple, then we just overwrite it. If not, then maybe you got to find another page that could, that could accommodate it, if there's no space in the page we're looking at. All right? Again, this is the core sort of idea of, of what, a, what the sort of heap files with, with, uh, with a page-oriented architecture and, and that's based on tuples. This is basically how any system would actually work. So what are some problems with this? We touched on some of these last class. Is it efficient? For reads, maybe, right? Right, because if I, if I need the entire tuple, I go to, get, go to one page and get it. That's OK. But if I start updating things, I start making writes, doing inserts, updates, deletes, I could end up with fragmentation in my pages, right? I could have pages that are not fully utilized, meaning I, I have a little empty space where I can't fit any new tuple, right? It's not big enough for a new tuple, but I, so I can't use it, but, it, but it's just wasted. It's just there. Right? Or even before, like, you know, if I don't run out of space, if, if I have to insert a new tuple, I got to allocate it. You know, assuming I have nothing in my table, I, I insert a new tuple, I allocate a page, I insert one tuple in that page, there's nothing else on that page. Again, depending on the size of my, my page, pages, which could be it's different for, per systems, there's a bunch of empty space that's just not being used. Next challenge we face is there's a bunch of useless disk I.O. So if I got to update one tuple, if it's not in memory, I got to go disk and fetch it. But if it's in that side that page, what am I getting? All right? We're not storing one tuple per page. I mean, you could, but uh, you know, you don't. You typically don't want to do that. So now, if I got to go update one page, or sorry, on one tuple, I got to fetch that entire page and bring in a bunch of data that may not even be what I need, right? Because there's a bunch of other tuples that I'm not updating. Same thing when I'm going to do a write. Right? If I'm only updating one tuple, I had to bring in 20 tuples in the page into memory. Now I got to write those 20 tuples back out. And the last issue is that we're going to get a, potentially a lot of random disk I.O. Again, the, the, the sort of the cop-out answer for people ask, like, is this more efficient or which, which approach is better? The answer is it always is depends in databases, right? So if your workload is only updating a single tuple at a time for a per query, then, you know, maybe this architecture isn't so bad. But if I'm updating 20 tuples at a time, and those 20 tuples are in 20 separate pages, I got to go read 20 separate pages in, in, from disk into memory. I got to update them, and I got to write out 20 different pages in memory, or sorry, from memory to disk. Now that's random I/O, and that's going to be slower. And then, not necessarily a problem with the architecture itself, but it may be the case that we're operating in an environment where we can't do those in-place updates that, bit, that we assume we could do in a slotted page architecture. I Meaning, I can't fetch a page that's in disk, bring it into memory, update it, and then write it back to where I got it from. Right? You can't do this in some cloud storage systems, right? S3, you can kind of trick it out using versioning, but like, I can't do in-place updates in some cloud database systems. And in the Hadoop file system, it's not that common anymore, but that would, there's another good example of like, that's a distributed file system where, again, I can't do in-place updates. I can only do appends. So this tube-oriented slotted page architecture wouldn't work in this environment because I can't do, I can't modify a page and write it back where I got it. 
right? So this is why we need to look at potentially alternative methods. And in particular, of all the problems that I just talked about, uh, they'll be solved with a log structured storage scheme. Um, and beyond the, the sort of the heap file, the side of page architecture, log structured storage is probably this, the second most common approach people take in database systems. It's probably even more common today because of embedded storage managers like RocksDB, which are log structured. So if you've ever seen a database system that's using RocksDB, they're, they're inherently log structured because RocksDB is log structured. And then we'll talk about another approach, not exactly log structured, it's sort of amalgamation of the two, will be index organized storage. Um, that's what MySQL and, and SQLite and others use. And then we'll finish off talking about how to actually represent the data of attributes in tuples. Right? We're sort of, again, we were working out you know, what a file looks like, what a page looks like. We're still sort of in that world. And then we'll spend more time talking about what the actual individual tuples look like, the values in the individual tuples. Okay? All right. All right. So log structure storage is an old idea. Uh, it's loosely related to log structured file systems, which predates it about 10 years. Log structured file systems were like eight, in the 1980s. The log structured storage uh, sort of was first proposed in the, in the mid 90s. Um, actually, in the textbook, they'll call them log structured merge trees. Uh, I'm not going to describe what, what the actual log structured merge tree looks like because I don't think you need to know the details of the tree part of it, right? Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll describe basically the same idea but without bringing in the tree because that makes, makes things slightly more complicated. Um, but the high level idea is, is what I care about, what I want you guys to understand. So the basic idea of the log structure storage is that instead of storing individual tuples, we're going to maintain a log record of the changes to those tuples. And think of it just like it's like a key value store, key value system. So I'm going to have the, some operation, either just put and delete, uh, and then I'm going to have a key value pair that, with the key corresponding to some tuple identifier. You can't use the record ID we did before because we're not going to have pages. We're not going to have all sets and slots. So we're not, it's not going to be that. Uh, but it'll be some key identifier, and then the payload would be here's the actual tuple itself that I'm trying to you know, install for the, the, in the put. And so as the, as the application inserts data or makes changes, we're going to append new log entries to an in-memory buffer, uh, just in the order that, that they arrive. And then at one, some point, that buffer is going to get full, and we're going to write it out the disk. Pretty simple, right? All right, so let's see the example here. So again, the only two operations we're going to have are, are put and delete, right? There's no insert, because that's just a put. There's no, there's no update, because that just to put, you know, doing blind write over top of whatever is there before. And so in our log file in memory, right, we're going to go from, uh, from oldest to newest. So at the beginning of the file or beginning of the buffer, that'll be the oldest entries. And then we're just appending to them as we make changes. Right? So the application may say, I want to go ahead and do a put on record 103. Where the 103 came from, we don't care. Assume that's some other upper part of the system that, that figured, that, figured that out for us. And then, again, the payload in the, in the log record would be we're setting the value to whatever record 103 is to, to 1, A1. Same thing. Next, next guy comes along. Uh, he wants to do a put of 104 and then updates that, that record. Right? And then if we have a delete, we, we just, again, we just delete, have the delete op operation in our log record and then with, again, the same tuple identifier. And keep appending to the log as we go along. Right? So in this example here, um, we don't need to go actually read what the original record was, or the original tuple was, anytime we want to update the log. At least, again, this, think of the lower bowels of the system. Obviously, if I'm doing a query like update, update table set, ID, or set value equals value plus one, I got to know what the original value was. Right? And that's essentially doing a read followed by a write. But at this lowest level of the system, we don't, know, we don't have to know what the, what the original value was for a given, given key. Right? And again, that's different than a, the, the tuple-oriented architecture where I had to go fetch the page that had the, the original tuple, and then I can update it. I don't have to do that with this. Right? So again, at some point, this, thing will get, this, this memory page will get full, and we got to write it out to disk. Right? And that's just literally just taking the entire contents of the, the memory page and plopping it down to a bunch of pages on the disk. Clear out my memory buffer and then start filling it up with, with, with new log entries. And then when that gets full, same thing. I write that out. 
Now, important thing about this, or there's two important th things to point out when we do this right. First of all, this is all sequential I.O. now, right? Because my, my, my in-memory page could be, say, like a megabyte or 10 megabytes. When that gets full, I write out sequentially those 10 megabytes to the file on disk. So no matter, again, in the tuple-oriented architecture or the page-oriented architecture where I would have you know, 20 tuples spread across 20 different pages, in this, in this environment with this setup, those 20 tuples are always going to be on the same uh, page when I write them out because they're just, just depending log records. The other important thing in this architecture is that once a page is written to disk, it's immutable. Meaning we can never go back and do in-place updates. We'll compact it, we'll see that in a second, basically doing garbage collection, but we never can overwrite a log record that was already there before. We're not covering distributed databases just yet, but there is some advantage to making sure your files are immutable. And it, you know, ignoring the like, oh, well, if, if I'm on a cloud storage, I can't do in-place updates. Uh, but it does make it easy now if it's just appending the log that's essentially what Paxos or, or something a raft is doing. They're just adding log, record, log records and never go back and, and making changes. Right? Because if you change in the log, it would just be a new log entry. Right? So this makes the architecture a lot easier once it's on disk and you, and you don't update it. Now, we, for now, we're going to ignore what happens if I need to write the, the memory buffer out before I want to, before it's you know, completely full. Like if I have running a query or a transaction that, that wants to make sure that my changes are written to disk before I tell the outside world that the data is safely written to disk, I may write this log buffer out uh, before it's finished or before it's full, uh, but I'll write it to a separate location, uh, like, like a local disk where I can do these kind of writes. But again, we, we'll ignore that for now. All right, and again, so in a, the log circuit architecture, this is going to make our writes really fast, much faster than in a tuple-oriented architecture. Because again, we're just, we're just appending log records and we write them out sequentially. But what's potentially going to be slower now? Reads, right? Again, in, in computer science and database systems, there's no free lunch. So we're making the writes go faster, but now the reads could potentially go slower. So to do a read, what do we have to do? Well, again, assuming, assuming something in our system has figured out I, you know, the ID or the key of the, the log record I want, like 102, 103, 104, we can ignore that for now. In order for us to find the log record for a given key, we first want to check the in-memory page, start at the end, because uh, that's the newest records, and then just scan sequentially in, in reverse order, going back to the beginning, until we find the log entry that we want. If it's not there, we may have to go to disk. We'll cover that in a second. So is this efficient? No, right? So a way to get around this, and this is where that log structure merge tree in the textbook comes in, but again, we don't have to worry about the details, is that they're going to maintain some kind of index, right? For every single record ID, it'll tell you where in the in-memory buffer page uh, is it located, or if it's not in-memory, where is it on disk, right? So to get record ID 104, I would just do some lookup in this index. I'm not telling you what data structure it is. It doesn't matter. It's typically going to be a B plus tree. Um, but some systems use tries. Some systems use skip lists. It doesn't matter. Right? Do my lookup and find 104, and that'll tell me what offset in the memory page, uh, in the memory buffer, has the data that I'm looking for. Right? In the case if I want to look at 103, then I've got to go out to disk and get it. Right? So far, so good? Yes? So without getting into details about what the index actually is, yes. is it possible to implement it in a append-only file system? The question is, um, so your question is, is it possible to implement the index in an append-only file system? Yeah. Oh, um, so, so yeah, so the way you would do this is like, um, you can sort of just treat this as a log itself. Uh, and then you, then in memory, you build a data structure on top of it. So like in a B plus tree, uh, in a typical, typically is done is like when you write the pages out the disk, uh, you're still maintaining the, the, the data structure itself, like the pointers between the children and parents and so forth. In, in this, this environment, you would basically reconstruct the in memory index by replaying the log. So you could do it in a read only file system. Actually, I don't know what RocksDB does. Yes? Is this index the same index uh, as what we, uh, 
know what we get when we run create index in SQLite. This question is, is this index the same index you would get when you run create index in SQLite? In specifically SQLite, no. Uh, well, so first of all, SQLite's not log structured. I guess you're basically asking, is this the same index as like a primary key index, right? Uh, potentially, yes, uh, but not always, right? SQL is kind of complicated. They're index organized pages, and then you can have the non -index, non index organ the non table indexes, and then the the primary key table indexes. Give me a sec. We'll get to that. Um, think of this as like. It's almost like the internal bookkeeping to find the find records, right? Almost like the page directory. It's not something you would you would necessarily expose to, like the SQL queries themselves, but you could you could use them for that. Yes. So it seems like the only thing that we're ever looking at is like the the indexes that point into the memory page. So why don't like why don't we just like maintain like a bunch of pointers to like the latest update rather than storing everything that's happened? So your question is uh, your statement is. This index is pointing to things that happen in memory, right. which is not true, right? It could point to on the disk. Sorry, it's only pointing to one thing. It's only pointing to the, the, yeah, the latest version of, of right. the, so yes. Why, why would we store everything? Before? Why do we store everything down here? Yeah. We'll get to that in a second. But like, uh, in this case here, I have, uh, what was it? it? ID equals 103. It's not in memory. It's somewhere on disk. So, but where, right? I can't just blow away the whole the whole file. I, I would have to pull it out, pull it out, right? And that's expensive. And that's compaction. We'll get that in a second. Yes. Why do we need to store the latest log record for delete? Uh, because like, I, I'm assuming if, if the if the tuple is not present, then it just isn't there in our index. Record. So the statement is: um, Why do we need to store this delete record if if it's if it's been deleted, why you even store that? Um, because there's going to be a put for like this, say one or two. This, there's a put before it, right? But say there was another put that got written at the disk. I again think of like I'm going back in time, and I want to make sure that like if I uh, if I don't have that delete, then it does exist, right? Because I can't go back and just, okay, you want to got deleted. Let me find the page where it's in and pull it out. I can't do that. So I just pen a log record and say, okay, if you're going back in time and you see 102, know, know it's been deleted. And then we'll call us them in a second to, to remove the extra entries of those things. Okay. So as, as, as both these guys sort of alluded to, is like, well, some of these log records, we don't need to maintain these forever, right? And delete was, was an example of this, or puts over the same key over and over again, right? And so in a log structure database system, what they're going to do is they're periodically going to run some background job that will compact the pages to, to coalesce them to reduce uh, redund redundant uh, operations. Right, so in this case here, I have page one, one and page two. Think of this going as uh, newest to oldest. or Sorry, oldest to newest. So this one is older than this one. And so if I want to compact them, then all I need to do is recognize that here are the latest entries that I care about for the keys that are, that are referenced in, in these two pages, right? So 103, 104, and then we delete 101 and 102, and then the put 105, right? Again, so like there's a put 105 here, but because this is newer than this put 105, we know we don't, we, you know, we want this one, not this one. So instead of storing two put 105s, we only need to store one in our coalesce pages. Right? And as, as he brought up as well, like, it may be the case that uh, I actually don't need to store the deletes at this point as well because uh, there's some other upper part of the system that says, all right, I've removed, uh, you know, I've removed 102, 101 from my index. So anybody does a lookup, they'll see a key not found, and therefore I, may, I don't need to store the log, the log entry for this. All right, so this is called compaction. Uh, and this is, this, this is, again, no free lunch. The, the log records, are gonna, or the, the log structure storage is going to make the inserts much faster because they're just depending to the log. But at some point, we're going to have to go clean things up. All right. So again, the idea is that we 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 do this compaction. Now we're done with. Now we're down to a a a, a, a compressed form of the of the log record. Again, this is only on disk. 
we can't do in place updates. So this is literally taking you know, one disk page, another disk page, and then writing out a new one. We're, we can't overwrite an existing one. Another important thing to keep track of, too, is that once it's on disk, we know that it's going to be older than, uh, or w once we have a page on disk, and once, once we've already compacted it, removing the, the redundant or the, the, the operations on the same key over and over again, that means that within a, a, a disk page we've compacted, it only contains, or each key is only going to be referenced once. At this point, we don't care about the, or the temporal ordering anymore, the log. We don't care about newest to oldest. Right? So now, if the operation we need to support is go find me key 103, 104, 105, or whatever in the disk, the temple ordering doesn't help us. And actually, what we want to do is sort the disk pages, sort the keys based, you know, sort, sort the, the records or the log records in the, in the disk page based on the keys. Right? So we do something like this. Because again, now all I need to know now is if I'm looking at this disk page, I know what these pages are older than, than each other, right? So I have sort of some metadata like that, but each log record, I, did, I don't need to know whether one's older than another. So the, when you do this compaction and then you sort them based on, on the key values, uh, these are sometimes called sorted string tables or SS tables. I think this, this, this term was coined by Jeff Dean and uh, the Sanjay guy when they wrote LevelDB at Google. This is for, for big table in the, in the mid-2000s. Um, and the, again, the advantage of this is that when I have to go fetch this disk page in, I'm not looking for like, give me the, give me the, the put for 103 at this timestamp. You're just looking for put 103. And so you want to do a lookup to find that, that, that record as quickly as possible. And so you, if you're sorted, you can then build like an index or a filter, some way to quickly jump to that, that record you're looking for, rather than having to do binary search across the entire file. So there'll be some metadata in the header for each of these SS table uh, pages that keeps track of, or sorry, files comprised of multiple pages that'll keep track of where the, uh, where the offsets are for the different keys. Yes? But wouldn't the index that we talked about previously already point to the corresponding one? The question is, wouldn't the index that we're talking about already point to the exact, um, the exact location of, of where something, something is? Uh, not necessarily. You may want to keep the um, uh, you may want to keep a more coarse grain index that says you know here's not maybe the exact offset of the thing you're looking for, but here's the page that or here's the file that has it, and once you get to that file, it'll tell you where to find it. Yeah, so maybe I'm not drawing a good example here. So this I'm saying disk page, this could be multiple pages for an SSD file, and typically because th these things get big, so it, it's not going to be a single page. Yeah, in the back, yes. For, for the SS table or the one back in memory? Back in memory, back in memory uh, yes, because you don't want to have to recreate it upon restart. Uh, and as I was saying it before, either you could just write the file, the pages themselves to disk, uh, or you could just uh, maintain a log record that says, here's how to rebuild the index. Yes? Why don't we write the pages in sorted order in the first place? Because if it's in memory, we could get rid of it. Yeah, so the question is, why don't we write the pages in sorted order at the beginning with? That's what they do, yes. Yeah. yeah, wouldn't the compaction have any impact on the read uh, performance because you might have to take some locks? Absolutely, yes. So his statement is, and he's right, isn't compaction going to have a impact on the performance of the reads? Because not only are you just taking locks, locks you're doing disk IOs, right? Because uh, now you're like, you're, you're, we'll get to different types of compaction in a second. Now you're potentially bringing in gigabytes of files in, compacting them and writing them back out. So absolutely, yes. Again, no free lunch. Okay, so there's, there's sort of two main ways you can do compaction. Uh, and this, this terminology here is, I'll use is, is what's used in, in RocksDB. Um, so the most simplest form is called universal compaction, where you're just taking adjacent sorted log files that are on disk. Again, these can be multiple pages. Think of like, again, megabytes, ter gigabytes, terabytes. And then you just want to take two, uh, two, two sort of these sort of log files that are adjacent, and then compact them, right? So I would take these two guys, basically do a, a sort merge, where they're already sorted, so now I'm just doing a merge, and figure out whether, 
you know, whether the, the different keys you're looking at, whether one is subsumed by another. Like assuming that this one, what I said, this one's older than this one. So if I see an update or put for like, you know, key 103 here and a key 103 there, then I know I want that one and I can throw the other one away. All right? And I can do the same thing for any, any possible uh, combination of these, these sort of log files. I can keep calling them in, into uh, more compact forms. Another approach is to do what's called level compaction. Again, this is what le the level in level DB comes from. Um, it, it actually, who here, here, who here has heard of level DB? Very few. Who here has heard of RocksDB? More. Okay, no, not much more. RocksDB is, is Facebook's fork of level DB. Google wrote level DB, RocksDB forked it. The very first thing they did, remove MMAP, right? Uh, and then they expanded and did, did a bunch of other stuff. And so this, this level compaction comes from, from LevelDB. All right, so you have your sorted file on disk. Uh, and at level zero, they're going to be a certain size. And you keep adding more sorted, sorted files until at some point you run compaction. And then you'll combine them down into uh, a larger file at, at the next level. Right? Make, make, keep making more of them at the top level. And at some point, that'll get merged together. And once I have enough at the next level, then I'll run compaction for that one and produce something at the lower level. So it's sort of cascading down. I'm getting larger and larger files as, as I go down. All right. So as I said, because RocksDB has sort of become the default choice for a lot of database vendors, database, people building database systems, as like the, like, of like the underlying storage manager to, to use, uh, they're essentially log structured, but then the, what they're building on top of RocksDB is all the SQL parsing layer, the, the, the SQL execution, the indexes, all the additional things we'll talk about throughout the semester. And like the RocksDB is essentially just providing a, 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 a key value API. Like you don't in, in in my examples here, I just said here's the value, here's the payload I'm putting out to, I'm storing in, in the in the log. It has no notion of attributes or columns, right? So even though I say I have, I have ten columns in my table, but I only update one of them. My put record has to contain all 10 columns. We'll see multi-versioning, how we can do in, later in the semester after, after the midterm, we can be smarter with this, which essentially looks a lot like log structure storage, but for now, we can ignore that. This is almost how Postgres, this is how Postgres was originally envisioned in, in the 1980s. Um, it looked look, look a lot like this. So as I said, RocksDB is, is super popular. Uh, LevelDB, is, and it's a fork of LevelDB, and this is just a sampling of, of, of different companies that are using, uh, using a log structure storage. Again, some are based on RocksDB. CockroachDB originally started off using RocksDB. They threw it away and wrote their own thing in Go called Pebble. Cassandra has their own uh, log structure storage. TidyB, TidyB has TidyKV. Uh, I think DGRAPH uses BadgerDB. But there's a bunch of these, in these, these log structure systems. So we already said the reads are slower. But what are some other problems we would have with uh, log structure storage? We said read was slower and the compaction was expensive. There's, there's one more uh, core issue with this approach. Yes? It seems less disk efficient. What do, mean, what, do mean, what do you mean disk efficient? Like you have to store extra copies of every tuple. And when you compact, you have to create, like you have to use other parts of disk to create the compacted page. So the statement is that, um, it's less efficient because you have to store pitching multiple copies of, of a tuple because there's a bunch of puts for them. And then when you do compaction, you basically have to have a staging area, more or less, where you, you, you have the two original files you're trying to compact, two or more, and then you're writing out a, a new one. Yes. That's, I would say that's, yes, that's an issue, yes. But what about the, related to this point of compaction, what am I doing? Well. At some point earlier, I had these log records in memory. I wrote them out the disk. Now for compaction, what am I doing? Reading it back into memory, writing out back out the disk. So this is called write amplification. And the idea is that, the issue is that for every sort of logical write I do in my application, like insert a tuple, update a single tuple, how many times am I going to read and write it back to disk? And in a log structure approach, potentially infinite, right? If I just keep compacting, compacting over and over again, obviously that doesn't, doesn't happen, but uh, I, could, I could potentially do, for a single logical write, I could do dozens of physical writes because I'm bringing it back to memory and writing it back out. 
again, in, in, the, in, the, in the page architecture with, with slotted pages, we don't have this problem. When I do an update a single tuple, I bring it, bring it a memory, I update it, I write it back out. And then if I never update it again, I never write it out again. We can ignore backups, we can ignore the write-ahead log, we'll, we'll get to that you know, later in the semester. But if, I don't, if, I'm not, if I'm not reading, I'm not using it, I'm not bringing a memory and, and writing back out. In a log structure storage, you have to. Okay? So again, if you want to go beyond this, there's the log structure merge tree part of the textbook. I think it's a bit, uh, it's overly complicated because it's really about like, how do you merge these trees based, it almost looks like the level compaction, but understanding that the, like, the low level data structure. The key thing I, I want you to understand is like, here's a different approach to storing tuples through these, these, these log records. And we'll see this idea pop up again when we talk about multi-version control and when we talk about distributed transactions, distributed databases. Yes? This question is, why is level compaction preferred over universal compaction? I don't know, I don't know if, it, if it actually is. Uh, I, don't mix, I don't think it makes a difference. And I, actually, yeah, and, and I don't know what the trade-offs are between the, the two of them. Um, other than it's like a, I, I think it's sort of like a cleaner architecture in terms of like, I know at this level, I'm going to compact it, and it's going to go to this size and go to the next level. Whereas in the universal compaction, you have to have some additional logic to decide, okay, if, if I could emerge this guy and this guy or this guy and this guy, which one should I do? But I, I, I don't think the, 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 the RoxyB manual has a lot of good information on this, the blog articles. I, I can post some Piazza if you want afterwards. Um, yes? Um, so you, uh, in the previous slide, it was like, you said that there was periodic compaction. Like, what does that mean? Is it like done asynchronously or is it like done yeah. on every read? Or yeah, so his question is, what do I mean by periodic compaction? Um, you would have some kind of trigger threshold or something that says it's time to compact, right? It could be, if it's level compaction, it could be, okay, I've, I've got uh, three of these guys, go ahead and run compaction, right? Or it could be, I've done this many of writes, go ahead and compact. And this is, so uh, it can be done basically at whenever. It's not, it doesn't have to be triggered by a read? Correct. It's the same. It doesn't have to be triggered by a read. It can be done whenever. Yes. Yeah. But it's like, uh, how do you say this? Uh, It's like, you know, if you need to change the oil in your car, you can go a long time beyond the, 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 you know, the mileage when you're supposed to, but it's kind of like you shouldn't, right? So it's sort of like the best practice is you want to, you know, you want to make sure you sort of do the upkeep you, that you need to do. But of course, like if you're running it every second, then like that's going to make your reads go slower. So it's the balance how to figure out how to, how to, when to do it. And again, we'll see this when we talk about Postgres and multi-version control. There's this thing called the auto vacuum. When, when should it run? How often should it run? It depends on, depends on the workload and the hardware. Okay. So the two approaches we talked about so far, again, the, the, the log structure storage and the, um, the sort of the, the page-oriented storage, these are tuple-oriented storage. These are, in these approaches, they all are going to lie on indexes to find individual tuples that are separate from the sort of core storage of the, of the tables, the tuples themselves, right? In the tuple end of storage, there's these pages, they're unordered, and to get that record ID, it gives us the page number and the slot number, there's some other magical data structure or index, I said, that's gonna get us there. Same thing for the log structure storage, we need, a, we need an index that tells us for a given record ID where to go find the data that we're looking for, right? And so an alternate approach is that what if we just keep the tuples automatically sorted uh, by just putting it inside the index itself? And then now you don't have a separate distinction between here's the log structure storage and then the index, or here's the, here's the, the slot of pages and here's the index. It's all just indexes. And so this is what is called an index organized storage or index organized tables. And the idea here is that assuming we have some tree data structure, or, or it could be a hash table, we'll, we'll, for now we'll assume trees. Instead of having the, the leaf nodes uh, in, in the tree with values, values that provide us the record ID that tells us where to go find the page that has the data we're looking for, what if the leaf nodes themselves were just the data pages with the tuples? So now when I do, want to do a lookup and say, find me key 102, I follow this index and then poop, I'm at the bottom. Uh, poof, not poop, uh, poof at the bottom. Uh, and there's the index I'm looking for. Or sorry, there's the data that I'm looking for. 
right? So this sort of idea looks like, again, this is what, this is a rough diagram of a B tree, which we'll cover soon, right? There's a distinction between the inner nodes and then the leaf nodes. The inner nodes are basically guideposts that tell you for a given key, should I go left or right, right? And then the leaf nodes themselves, these will look a lot just like slotted pages. But the difference is that we're going to sort them in, in the actual tuple, or in the page itself, based on the key and not just a random location in the, uh, based on you know, where, where we had a free space in the slot array. So now, again, when I, when I want to do a lookup, find me key 102, I traverse the index, I get to a leaf node, I pop over here, and then I do binary search on the, the, the list of keys, and then that'll give me an offset to go find where the data I'm looking for. So this is what, this is how MySQL, when you use the InnoDB engine, this is, what, this is what you get. For SQLite, this is what you get as well. I think I said last class in SQLite, uh, they had this internal primary key called the row ID, right? And we, we could see it through SQL, but it, it's slightly, it's different than the, than the primary key you may define in your, in, your, in your table itself, right? Because they're using index organized storage, and then the row ID is, is the key that you do lookups of in, in, inside, of the, in, in, inside of this index. So for the real primary, sorry, the logical primary key, say like you know a customer or a, a student email address, we would have a separate index that then maps the 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 email address to the row ID. Then you do a lookup in the primary key index um, to get to get the actual tuple that you're looking for. Yes. So there's two keys. There's one key for the page and then one key inside the page. The question is: There's two keys. One key for to get to the page and one key inside the page. Uh, no, so like if I again if I'm if it's SQLite, find me row ID equals one. I just traverse this index. The keys are based on row ID. I land in the page. Now I need to find within the page where row ID one is, and I, I do my lookup on this. Oh, so the entire tree is sorted. The, the entire tree is sorted. Yes, it has to be because it's, 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 it's a balanced tree. So you get this in SQL Server and 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 Oracle, but not by default. You have to tell it I want this. Uh, if you use my SQL SQLite, you get this by default. I don't, I, actually, I don't think you can turn it off. Yes? Does this approach still suffer from the downsides like fragmentations and um, discard all? Yeah, so his question is, he's, 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 it's a good point. Does this approach still suffer from the things we talked about before, like fragmentation and, uh, and uh, uh, random I.O.? Well, so for fragmentation, yes. It's unavoidable because in a B plus tree, uh, it needs to be at least half full. So you could, you're going to have a bunch of leaf nodes that are, that are, that are going to be empty. That's unavoidable. In terms of the random I.O., if it's updates to random locations in the, in the leaf nodes, yes, that's unavoidable. But if you're just inserting, right, then again, using, uh, using SQLite's row ID as an example, the row ID is just an eternal counter. For every new tuple, increment that counter by one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a monotonically increasing. So if I just keep inserting to SQLite, I'm just going to keep appending to this side of the tree and not touch the other side of the tree. So it's not as bad as doing a bunch of random IOs. It's not as sorry, it's not as good as doing the sequential IO you get log structured, but it's better than it may have in a tuple oriented storage because at least now the tree is guiding me to only update pages on, on the side over here. So there is some benefit to it. Yes. The question is the row ID is the row ID is finding a page and key ID is finding the tuple. No, so what I was trying to say in SQLite, the, uh, there's there's the primary key index that that, that stores the, the the tuples and the leaf nodes, but instead of being whatever the primary key you tell it like in your create table statement, they have an internal row ID as the is the primary key. So if you do a lookup like you know where email address equals Andy. Uh, there's some other index that's going to give you the row ID, and then, then you use that to traverse the primary key index. In, uh, in MySQL in ODB, they don't do that with a row ID. It's, it'll be the, the, the real primary key you declare in the create table statement. That'll be the, the key you're using here. Right? And, that'll, and that's, that's the lookup that you have over here. Again, and then the pages look like slot, just slot architecture where the the key and the offsets are growing in one direction, and then the, the, tuple ID, the tuples are growing in another direction. Okay? 
All right, again, so the, the three major approaches for storing, storing tuples at, at sort of, uh, uh, you know, within files are going to be the, the heap storage with the slotted pages, the log structure storage with, with the appends and the SS tables getting rid of disk, and then this index organized storage. Again, there's other ones like, like the ISAMs, uh, but these are archaic or they're, they're legacy and we, we don't need to worry about it. Okay? All right, so let's talk about now. Once we got, once we have a, uh, once we got to this, like a tuple, let's talk about what, what's actually in it now. So a, a tuple is just a sequence of bytes. And it, it's the job of the database management system, based on the schema that, that it's storing in its catalog, like when you call create table, of like I, ha I have these attributes of these types, it's the job of the data system to interpret what those bytes actually are and how to, how to do whatever the operation that it is you want, you want on it. Right? If I have two columns, I'm going to column, column A plus column B, the database system is going to know, okay, well, column A is a 32-bit integer, column B is a 64-bit integer, therefore I need to do you know, the, 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 the addition operator based on the, those two types. Right? And so you can sort of think, again, just think of it as just a, a byte buffer, you know, a char array. Uh, there'll be some header that says, it keeps track of like the, maybe the size of it, the nulls, we'll talk about in a second. And then after the header's done, at the first offset, you would have the, the first column, the ID column, um, here. And then followed, at, and we know the ID is, is an integer, so that's going to be 32 bits. Then after 32 bits, we'll have the value, which would be 64 bits. And so internally, basically the data system, if you want to do it in C++, is looking, gets the, the, the starting location of the, of the tuple, right, using whatever the, the slot array method or however we get to jump to that offset in a page. The, the header is always going to be the same size for every single tuple, so we know how to jump past that. And then now we just do simple arithmetic to say, I know that the, the, the offset of this first column that I'm looking for is this so many bits or bytes after the header. Or if I want the second column, how to get, how to get there. Var char is a little bit more complicated. You have to store the length of the field, and that could, that could be in the header, right, or, or in line. For now, it doesn't matter. But essentially what you're just doing, you're just taking some address, and you're doing reinterpret, reinterpret cast to say the, 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 the system itself should treat that address, uh, that's starting by that address, as a 32-bit integer or 64-bit integer or whatever the type is. Yes? Yes. Who else would be doing it? Well, we're, we're writing SQL, right? Like, so the SQL, there's no interpret cast in SQL. This is like the implementation. Yeah. Again, this class is like we're doing this, not, not the JavaScript programmer, right? All right. So someone brought this up last class, and, on a, and it, which is a good topic, and I, and I wanted to include it, is one of the things we need to be careful now of, of in, as we start storing these bits is dealing with alignment to make sure that the data we're storing aligns to the uh, to how the CPU actually wants to operate on data. So what do I mean by this? I, I actually, the reason I put Andy sucks is like people take my slides and they don't know what Andy sucks means, and so I, I Google that and you find who CPU copies it. Um, all right, so. We need to make sure that all their attributes are aligned to, uh, based on the word boundaries of the CPU or whatever the architecture we're running on, to ensure that we don't end up with unexpected behavior when we do operations on this data, and and that the CPU doesn't have to do extra work. Um, so let's say I have a table. I have four columns here. I have a 32-bit integer, a 64-bit uh, timestamp, a, time a four-byte char, and then a, a zip code. Right, and so assume that we're gonna we're gonna break up our char array representing this tuple into 64-bit words. Cache lines are 64 bytes, uh, but Postgres lines are based on 64 bits. Or I don't know what SQLite does, uh, but they're they're all doing some some variation of this. Right. So the first thing we're gonna do is again we have our for ID column that's 32 bits. We store that there. Then we have this this date timestamp, the creation date. That's 64 bits. So we just store that right after that and so forth with the, the other ones, right? And so again, now when I want to do a lookup in, in my system to do, do some operation on this, this 
byte array that I've gotten for this tuple, say on the customer date, the creation date, the problem with this is that that attribute is going to span two words, right? Because this was each word is 64 bits. The first ID field was 32 bits. So this 64 bits spans two consecutive words. So then you know what happens when you do this in a CPU, right? When you try to jump to a memory address to do some operation on something that spans uh, the word boundaries. What does x86 do? So x86, Intel likes to, likes to make your life easy and not have to worry about these things. So they'll do the extra reads for you, right? It's good. They want to hide it. They want to hide all, the, all the, the, the complexities of the architecture. So they'll, they'll do extra work. But now this is going to make your data system run slower because what should have been you know, one, one register read or one cache line read to go fetch something uh, into a CPU register, now it's going to be two cache line reads, right? But again, there, there's no error. It just Intel takes care of it for you. But not every system, not every architecture will do that. Uh, previously before, in ARM, uh, they would give you, they would reject it. They would recognize that you're trying to do a, a misaligned operation and then throw an error hoping you would catch it. Now, in the newer versions, I think ARM 7, they, they handle it now like Intel does. Um, but there's, uh, it, it's just slower. This is rare, but what could happen is that it, It'll do the reads for you, uh, but there's no guarantee that the, the, the bits are going to land in the right order. Right? So going back here, I have to do two reads to get this word and this word uh, to, get, to put together the, the, date, the date attribute. It may put the, the, the last bits in front of the other ones. It seems like a terrible idea, but there are, the older CPUs would do that. Of course, that means now your program is going to have random errors and, and, and messed up data, and people are going to notice and complain, and that's bad. Again, that's part of the reason why Intel tries to hide that from you, even though it makes your thing run slower. All right, so we need to make sure that our, none of the attributes in our tuple, in our, essentially in our byte array, because again, now we're talking about things we brought into memory, that none of them are going to span these, these boundaries. So the two approaches to handle this are padding and, or reordering. So with, uh, with padding, the basic idea is to recognize that if I'm breaking up to 64-bit words, as I add my attributes as going across, if I recognize that the next attribute doesn't fit within my single word, then I'll just put a bunch of zeros there and pad that. And then internally, the bookkeeping of the system, as, as when, it's, when it's interpreting these bytes, it knows that, oh, okay, I need this, this ID here, and then the, and then the, the date, 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 date attribute, that's going to be the next word, so just ignore these, these 32 bits there. The other approach is do reordering. Um, I don't think any, most systems don't do this automatically. Uh, some of the academic systems, we built one that did this, uh, will do this automatically. But most systems will lay out the bits exactly where you tell it and then put padding in to, to, to make it better. So the idea here is that if I keep the, the sort of a logical view of the, of the table, like whatever defined the quick table statement, I'll tell you if things are sorted in this order. But underneath the covers, I'll just move things around uh, to, so I can pack things in better. And then, if necessary, I'll, I'll pad bits at the end like that. Yes? So how are varchars handled in this case, especially for reordering and padding? This question is, how do varchars handle in this case, especially for uh, padding? Yeah, for padding. Uh, that's what I'm saying. So in the systems that do automatic reordering, you don't store the var chars in line unless they're less, unless they're 64 bits or less, and instead you store a pointer to some other location. That we'll see in a second. These these external not, these uh, oversized attribute tables or, or pages that are sort of separately. So you can do this reordering and not worry about uh, variable length things. Yeah. Do we need that last word for the uh, His question: Do I need this last like this thing here? Do I need this? No. So uh, we can see this in Postgres. We, so Postgres will not do re automatic reordering, but it will do uh, padding. And there's some simple things we can see about like if we, when, when we reorder reorder the, when, when we reorder reorder the create table statements or reorder tuples, 
that, that we, can, we can store things in, in less space. So, um, so just more Postgres syntax here. But Postgres has this nice little function called row. And essentially, it just takes a, the, the comma separated list of values you give it. It makes a row, right? And then we can cast it now. We can add this, this colon colon thing at the end of all our, our values. And that, that'll, that'll that basically casting the value to a, to a given type. So I can do uh, a small int, a regular int, and a, and a big int. So a two byte int, four byte int, or, or eight byte int, right? So now Postgres has a nice little function called uh, PG column size that'll tell you the, the size of this, 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 this record, this tuple, in bytes. So in this case here, uh, it's telling me the size of this row that I created is four bytes. If I go back to my previous one um, and run that, yeah, sorry. Go back to the, the row I had before without casting to the types and told me it's 36. Right, which makes sense because uh, this last one here, I was making that be a uh, 64-bit integer, or Postgres, I think in this case here, it's storing it as uh, all eight bytes, or like four bit, four byte integers, 32-bit integers, and then a little extra space for uh, padding. Okay, so we can see this now. If we take a, let me do it first without the size. So let's make a row that has some chars, and then uh, you know, two byte, four byte, and, and eight byte integers. But I'm intermixing the chars with the, 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 with, the, with the integers, right? So if now, if I say, I ask Postgres, what is the size of this? I get 48 bytes. But if I redo it where I put all the integers first, basically reordering as I was showing before, and then put the chars all at the end, now I get down to 44 bytes. Again, because Postgres has to pad things out to, to make sure that everything is 64-bit aligned. But it doesn't do, you, do this for you automatically. You have to do it. You have to tell Postgres, I want this. Again, where there's some systems that will, can do this for you automatically. Make sense? Again, I like this because again, just through SQL commands, we can get a... We can get a view to the slightly to the internals of the storage manager of a database system to say how is it actually laying things out. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about we talked about integers. We talked about uh, the the var chars a little bit. Let's talk about, about the other sort of the, the core SQL data types and how the data system is actually going to represent them. So for all integer data types. These are essentially going to be the same thing as you get when you allocate a variable of an of a, you know, integer type or you know, uh, a, a large int, whatever, in, in C++. It's going to be the same representation because that's what the hardware supports. The hardware is going to have, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a standard that, uh, uh, representation for whatever two's complement integers, either signed or unsigned. Whatever you get in C++, that follows the standard, and that's what the hardware supports, and that's what you get in SQL. Right. For floating points or, or, or floating point numbers or fixed point numbers, uh, there'll be floating point or real numbers. And again, that's defined in the IEEE 754 standard. It specifies how hardware should represent these these decimal numbers. But every data system is also going to have what are called fixed point decimals, so numeric or decimal, where each of those implementations are going to be different per system. And we can see the performance difference of, 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 the, of, of the two approaches in a second. For varchar, var binary, text, and blobs, these are typically going to be stored as uh, something like with a header that tells you the length of it, followed by the bytes of the, of the actual value. Or if it's too big to be stored in line in the tuple itself within, within a page, there'll be a pointer to some other page that has the data that you need for this, for this attribute. So I said for, for an in-memory system, uh, for the, uh, if it's less than 64 bits, they'll store it uh, in line. If it's not, then they store a pointer. In, uh, in, the different, in, in a disk-based database system, it's going to depend on the implementation. 
and we'll see, again, we'll see that in a second. For timestamps, dates, uh, and intervals and so forth, these are going to be typically 32 or 64-bit integers. That are, that's just the number of milliseconds or microseconds since the Unix epoch, right, January 1st, 1970. And if you, if you want to store this with, with, uh, with timestamp information, typically they'll, they'll store it as the U, based on UTC timestamp, right? Uh, whatever, GMT0. Uh, and then they store additional metadata to say, what timestamp are you in? And they can, they can convert it as needed. And the system handles that for you. So because for these, the, these types up here, right, the integer types, because we're relying on the hardware to store whatever to store the data how the hardware wants to represent it, that typically means you just can't copy the files, like the raw database files that you generate, from one architecture to another. Like if it's big Endian or, or little Endian, like x86 is little Endian power and ARM or big Endian, like you can't take the binary files from the data system and put it to another one because they're going to, you know, the bits are going to be flipped and it'll get messed up. SQLite avoids this problem where they, because they store everything as actually var chars. And at runtime, they cast things based on the type uh, in the attribute. Because then they get that portability uh, guarantee. And no matter where you, know, what, where you plop the file in, uh, they'll always have it in, in, the, in the right order. All right, so I want to spend a little time talking about floats and reels and numerics. And again, this will be a good example of where the database systems are going to do something different. Um, and the you can't just rely on the hardware to do, do certain things for you because we care about correctness of data, and the hardware can't guarantee that for us. All right, so for variable precision numbers, right, just like before in, in integers, we're going to rely on the uh, C++ implementation for this. Right? So if you call float, real, or double in SQL, you'll, you'll get the same like float or double you would get in, in C++. And so typically, these are going to be faster than the fixed, fixed point numbers, so we'll see in a second, because the hardware can natively support this. Um, but then the problem is, though, like they're not going to have the, they can't guarantee the, the, the correctness of values when you start doing larger calculations because of rounding issues, because you can't store exactly uh, you know, decimals in, in hardware. So everyone's probably seen you know, uh, a simple test uh, program like this when you first learn, learn C or C++. Right? I have two floating point numbers, two 32-bit floating point numbers. I want to store 0 0.1 and 0 0.2. And then I just want to add them together and see what the output is. Right? So in the first version, I'll just call printf to dump out the, you know, the x plus y like that. And I would expect I would get something that look, should look like oh, you know, 0 0.3. Right? And when I run that, I actually get that, and that looks, that looks OK. But in actuality, if I increase the number of, uh, of, of digits I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to write out in my printf statement, now I end up with something that looks like this. right? Because again, the horror can't represent 0 0.3 exactly. It's going to be some approximation based on that. So OK, if I'm doing you know, a simple program like before, where I was just doing x plus y, and I print that out to, to a human, yeah, sure, maybe that's not a big deal. right? But if I'm doing you know, complex calculations because I'm trying to land something on the moon or you know, put a satellite in space, or if it's your bank account and you're doing interest calculations, then this rounding error is, is actually going to matter. And people are going to notice and complain. So for this reason, database systems are also going to provide these fixed precision numbers, or fixed point decimals, where the, the database system is going to do a bunch of extra work to make sure that you don't have these rounding errors. You can get this in, in Java with big decimal. You can get this in Python, I think, with decimal type as well, right? They're all basically, all the different systems are going to do something slightly different. But at a high level, essentially, they're going to store a, a, a variable length representation of the number you're trying to, trying to represent. And then additional metadata to tell you where the decimal point is, or whether it's signed or unsigned, or is it negative, and, or not a number, and so forth, right? Again, we have to do this extra work because the hardware can't guarantee this for us. So here's what Postgres does. So this is the numeric type of Postgres. This is actually from the source code itself. And you can see that they're going to represent the type of a numeric as some kind of struct with a bunch of additional metadata about what the number actually is. But the core thing they're storing that, that internally, along with this metadata of like, here's how to store the actual number itself, is this numeric digit uh, array here, 
Well, that's just a typecast to an unsigned char up above. So they're literally storing your decimal as a, as a string value, and then they use this metadata to figure out you know, how to then interpret that string to, to put it to be the correct form. So again, the hardware doesn't know anything about this. This is what the data system has implemented. So we can't just do you know, x plus y like we can in C++. We've got to do more complicated uh, arithmetic when you want to start calculating or you, you know, using these numeric types in, in, in queries. So this is just a, a brief snippet of the, the addition function for two numerics in Postgres. And as you can see, there's a bunch of checks for that struct uh, where we're checking to see whether it's zero or negative or signed or whatever. Right? And this is just to add two numbers together. This is obviously going to be way more expensive than you know, calling a single structure in the CPU you know, x plus y. I don't want to give the impression I'm, 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 uh, I'm you know, shaming Postgres. My SQL has the same issue, right? They're doing the same thing. They're going to store their, uh, instead of their digit as a var chart, they're going to store it as a 32 bit integer. But again, they have additional metadata to keep track of what the, what the, thing, what the, the numeric type actually is. And just like Postgres, they're going to have a, uh, you know, their own implementations of doing addition that does all the additional checks. It's not sexy, but you, you, know, you, you do need it. Um, so in the sake of time, if we have time at the end, we can do a demo to show you the performance difference. But it's about 2x, right? The, the, the numeric versions or the, 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 the Davis implemented versions of these decimals, it would be about 2x slower than the than like the hardware versions. All right, for nulls, the, the most common way to do this is that for every single tuple in that header will be a bitmap that keeps track of which attributes that are set to null for that given tuple, right? And again, the, the header, the size of, of this bitmap will vary based on the number of attributes you have, which we know whether it could be null or not because it's in the create table statement. Right? Again, there's the advantage of using a schema. Instead of just storing JSON whatever in there, we have a schema. We, we know whether a column has been, been defined as not null or not. And therefore, if, if, it, if, it, if it has been declared as not null, we don't need to store this bitmap. Or uh, you don't need to store an entry for it. So this is the most common approach. Now, there does mean there's some overhead here. right? For every single tuple now in the header, we got to have this, 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 this bitmap. Less common, but another approach to do this would be uh, to have special values, where you basically say there's some value within the range of values I could have for each type, that if I have that value, then I, I'll assume that, that it's, it's, it's a null. So if I want to know whether a 32-bit a integer is, is null, then I'll say the 30-bit the min number I could have, like negative whatever it is, uh, if my value is that, then I'll treat that as null. So it's one less value I could potentially store. And now there's a bunch of extra stuff I have to do in the rest of my system to, to keep track of, OK, if I'm looking at a 32-bit uh, a integer, if it is that min value, then I know it's null and not, you know, not let people insert it arbitrarily. The worst choice, uh, and I don't have a, I don't have a uh, screenshot of this. Actually, I might. Um, the worst choice, I've only seen one system ever actually do, is for every single tuple itself, sorry, every single attribute in the tuple, you have a little flag in front of it that tells you whether it's null or not. And the reason why this is terrible is because uh, when, when we talk about alignment, right? I can't have a, uh, you know, I can't have a 32-bit integer and then put one bit in front of it to say, hey, this thing's null or not. I got to store another byte. Right? So now all my 32-bit integers. And if I want to be 64-bit aligned, maybe I've got to store the double size. So like, if to store a 32-bit integer to keep track of whether it's null, if I'm putting this flag in front of it, I may have to store another 32 bits just to have one bit to say that it's null or not. Uh, do I have a screenshot here? Let me see. The only system that I know that actually did this was MemSQL, which is the earlier name of, uh, of, of single store. So despite them you know, sponsoring the class, yeah, I don't, I don't have the screenshot here. I'll post it on Slack. Um, that was the shittiest idea. Uh, it's one of the shittiest ideas I've ever seen. Um, but they got rid of it, right? Because it's super wasteful, and they do the the column header now, right? For large values, uh, like really large values, variable length values, the most data systems are not going to let you store them uh, directly in the page itself, right? Again, 
a page size is the, the, the is defined by the database system, and every single page within that 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 database or that table has to have the same page size, right? I can't, there's a, there's an experimental system at a, at a Germany that they can support variable length pages. We can ignore that. Nobody nobody else does that. Um, but so that means that like at some point I have to decide should I store this large varchar, large string in in my my tuple page or not. And so for this, if it exceeds uh, for everything, they're going to have different thresholds to say when can you not store it and when you have to put it into what is called an overflow page. So in Postgres, they call it the toast. I forget what it actually stands for. But any attribute that's larger than two kilobytes, they'll store it as a separate page. And then in the actual tuple itself, they'll just have a pointer, a record ID, and an offset that then points to where to go find the actual value that you're looking for. All right? And again, you as the SQL programmer, you don't know this, you don't care. You call a select star on the query, and the data system is responsible for, for going reading the, 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 the base tuple, recognizing that there, it's pointing to an overflow page, go get that data, and then copy it into the, the buffer that it then produces the output for you. So it hides underneath the covers that, that it's actually done this for you. All right, so Postgres is, is two kilobytes. Uh, they have up to eight kilobytes. Uh, I think you can tune this, but it goes up to, obviously you can't exceed eight kilobytes. In MySQL, the overflow size is one half the current page size. And then in SQL Server, Surprisingly, you can set the, the, the default is if it exceeds the size of the page, then it overflows. So the, the size of the data you're trying to store in this, this oversized attribute plus the, the regular data, if the combination of that exceeds the size of a page, then they'll, they'll put the oversized, oversized data to another page. Right? And you can chain these things together. So if, say you want to store, for whatever reason, a one gigabyte video or 10 gigabyte video, your data system could, couldn't let you do that. And then this overflow page, since they all have to be the same fixed length size as well, it could just have a pointer to say, okay, here's the data for this range of the data for this, for this attribute, but oh, by the way, here's a pointer to, to the next page. And you've got to follow along that linked list to go get all the data and put it back together. All right, so the last thing you, you can do is called external file storage, external value storage. And this is where the, the database system is not going to store the... The, the large data, the large attribute in pages that it manages, it's going to write it out to your local file system and then internally store the URI or the URL of where that data is located so that when you query against the table and, you know, and you go get that attribute, it goes to the OS and goes gets that, that, that data, copies it into its buffer, and then hands it back to you. So in, I think only Postgres, or sorry, Oracle and, and, and my C, Oracle and SQL Server can do this. Um, in Oracle, they're called B files. In Microsoft, they're called file streams. And again, it's just a URI to some data on, on disk, and you, it does the syscall to go get it from the, from the operating system. In Postgres, you can do this for, uh, they're called foreign data wrappers. Um, there's, there's additional mechanisms to go store data in cloud storage. And, and then, again, now within a single SQL interface, I can go fetch the data and, and, and have it appear as if it was in the, 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 the table itself. So when we write things out to these external files, the database system cannot, cannot ch make any changes to it, right? It's, it's like you've written out to, to the file system. I'm not going to go and make in-place updates to it. I can't update it. I can only read it in, and then if I delete the, if I delete the tuple that this thing, that, that's pointing to this file, there's mechanisms to decide, do I also want to delete the file as well? And so the reason why, why this, you may want to do this is because, as I said, you don't want to store like a 10 gigabyte file in your database system. For, uh, for, for management reasons, because then it's a log record, you have to, you know, that, that becomes expensive. But also, too, typically database management systems are stored on uh, higher end hardware, and that makes storage expensive. Like if you use uh, Amazon RDS, I think they charge 4x more for storage than, they, than you get from EBS. And certainly EBS is even more if you have a locally attached, attached disk. Uh, so you don't want to be storing these large files that maybe are on read only. Uh, directly in the in the data that's managed by the the, the 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 files that are managed by the data system, let the OS on some cheaper storage handle that for you. So there's a paper from I'm 15 years old now from Jim Gray, which is the, the, one of the guys that won the the, the Turing Award for databases in the 90s, and he invented a lot of the stuff we're talking about this semester. Um, he had a paper he wrote uh, for, at Microsoft a few years ago that talks about whether should you store large data in, in, a, in a data system or not. And I think for their recommendation, they said anything larger than 256 kilobytes, store it externally. Um, 
again, this is the while ago. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't recommend that anymore. Um, and actually, we had the guy that invented Sequel Light. He came to CMU, gave a talk uh, five years ago. So, and he mentioned that uh, in his experience, it's actually better to store things in, in, in Sequel Light, like uh, if you're running on like a, like a phone app. So if you have like your application has a bunch of thumbnails, images, you're better off storing that in the database system because now when you when you go retrieve them, your your application already has the handles of the database system open. That's already the files already open. So it's much faster to, to go get those those thumbnails directly from the database system versus having to do a bunch of f opens and f reads to a bunch of files on disk. Um, so I would say I mean I this is pure conjecture. Fifty megs or less is probably okay. Anything beyond that, you want to use external storage. And ORMs like Django and other other application frameworks, they have mechanisms to, to handle that for you. Okay. Uh, so next class, next class we'll again continue on storage. Talk about storage models and then columns versus uh, row, row, row storage. And this will be again explaining to you why DuckDB is faster than SQLite. And on that note, the DuckDB people sent me stickers. If you want one, come get one. I have pins too. Hit it. <laughs> this shit is gangsta. <laughs> gangsta. <laughs> Bad boys are gangsta. <laughs> you ain't nothing but gangsta. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Now listen, I'm the poppy with the motherfucking hookup. 28 a gram, depending on if it's cook up. You ain't hit a mob yet? Still got you shook up? I smack you with the bottom of the clip and tell you, look up. Show me where the safe's at before I blow your face back. I got a block on taps. The feds can't trace that. Style is like tamper proof. You can't lace that. The Dominican. Or you could call me Dominican. Black skelly, black leather, black suede Timberlands. My all black 38 to send you to the pearly gates. You get Kazama trying to skate and that's your first mistake. <laughs> I ain't lying for that cake. Your fam will see you wake. My grams is heavyweight and ran through every state. When they ask me how I'm living, I tell them I'm living great.